Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. It's been a fierce primary election season, and one of the most closely watched races in the country is playing out in the Hoosier State. It is now Messer, Rokita, and Braun. There's no longer a clear front runner. A closer look at the race coming up and how the tone of the primary race could impact the general election. Plus, we'll dive into the 9th district race where three Democrats are going head to head for the chance to potentially challenge first term representative Trey Hollingsworth in the general election. And young voters can make a big difference in some of this year's most competitive races, if only they would show up to the polls. I feel like young people feel like their vote's not going to matter because there's so many people like in America, you know. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state. It has become apparent that we're, we need some help. Right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Three Republicans are vying for a chance to unseat Democratic Senator Joe Donnelly. The race between former State Representative Mike Braun and Congressman Luke Messer and Todd Rukita has been dubbed one of the nastiest in the country. Brandon Smith reports on a campaign marked by attacks and few policy differences. The Senate Republican primary was rough even before it began, with Luke Messer and Todd Rakita trading barbs even before they became candidates. The addition of Mike Braun did nothing to quell the sparring, and the airwaves are blanketed with attack ads. Mike Braun and Luke Messer, not conservatives. Todd the fraud, Luke the loser, the swamp brothers. But the candidates also have a lot in common, and each aligned himself with President Trump, including Braun, who says Trump's presidential run inspired his own Senate campaign. Hoosiers liked him when he ran and like him now, if not better, because he represents something different. For Messer's part, he says he backs the president's policies because he thinks most Hoosiers support them. And frankly, they appreciate the most important personal attribute of this president, that he's a fighter, that he's willing to challenge the status quo. And Rokita, he says Hoosiers like Trump's unpredictability. He is turning political correctness on its head. And uh, you know, I think that's for a lot of folks, including me, uh, that's refreshing. And that support for President Trump extends even to decisions that could be unpopular with key constituencies, including farmers. The president made a decision in March to impose tariffs on Chinese imports, which prompted retaliatory Chinese tariffs. That has Hoosier farmers worried it could hurt their industry. But Braun brushes aside those concerns. That's if and it's hypothetical, and I trust uh, President Trump and his group of advisors to make the right calls. Messer says he understands farmers' concerns, but he too has faith in the president's decision. And so the details of how we roll this out over time will be important, but I trust the president to implement it in a way that's good for Hoosier farmers. Rokita says he wants to play an active role in that implementation. As this, these targeted uh, tariffs play out, I'm going to make sure that no sector, agriculture or any other one, is inequitably hurt by this. All three candidates also agree with the president's recent targeted airstrikes in Syria. They're in line on medical marijuana. They don't support it. And they're of one mind on Robert Mueller's Russia investigation. They all say it needs to end. They also tout the Trump administration's federal tax reform, which Messer and Rokita voted for, and Braun says he would have. But despite all those similarities, the candidates mostly focus on tearing each other down. With regard to my two opponents, I'm not waiting till October or November or whenever it is for Joe Donnelly to stick a fork in him. While Rokita calls his fellow candidates flawed, Messer is more specific. And Mike Braun, 
You've got a candidate who is a lifetime Democrat, now says he's a conservative. Uh, Todd Rakita has run around the state with a MAGA hat on, with a cardboard cutout over his shoulder, pretending he has the Trump-Pence support. Braun also invokes the president in his attacks. Representative Messer was a never-Trumper. And now we know that uh, Representative Rokita called him vulgar and not presidential. The charged rhetoric in the race has received national attention, but the candidates say they're not bothered by it. Rokita says the party will remain united, and Braun says he'll support whoever emerges from the primary. Messer won't quite make the same pledge, saying he's not contemplating anything other than his victory right now. And Brandon Smith joins us now to talk about this contentious race. Thank you so much, Brandon, for being here. Absolutely. So in the primary's final debate, Messer suggested that most voters are undecided. Do you agree with that? I think that's probably what he's hoping a little bit because a lot of the polling that I've seen and heard about has him in third place at this point. But it is very, very close. That we do know. It's kind of tightly packed between all three of these guys. And it does... And they're, and the polls, again, that I've seen, which are, by the way, not public polls, they're mostly the candidates, uh, the campaign's polls, suggest that there is a decent chunk of Hoosiers who haven't made up their minds. In fact, one Republican state lawmaker that I talked to about this just a week ago said he might make up his mind as he walked into the voting booth. Um, so these three, as I, as I noted in the mm -hmm. piece, not a lot of policy difference separates them. It's a more of a stylistic difference. So I think that's probably helping contribute to the fact that a lot of Hoosiers are still figuring out who's going to be the person they, they punch that ballot for. We haven't talked much about the different campaigns and fundraising. Uh, how are they going, and is that going to make an issue in this campaign? Uh, for the most part, they're, they're each going into the final stretch here with roughly the same amount of cash on hand, a little over a million dollars each. Uh, the, the number in fundraising that pops out to you in this is Mike Braun has raised a lot more or at least he has uh, taken in a lot more into his campaign than the other two. In fact, as much than the, as the other two combined. But that's because almost all of his money is from himself. Mm -hmm. He is largely self-funded in this primary. Now, it probably won't matter because in the general election, this is going to be one of the most expensive races in the country. Money won't be a problem for any candidate in this race. So let's talk about someone who's not been talked about much, Joe Donnelly. Of course, he's running right now in the primary unopposed. Right. So what's his game plan been, and what happens now? He's been pretty low-key. Yeah. Uh, I think he's pretty happy that all the attention is for, sort of focused on the Republican side, particularly because the, the narrative that has been that it's been so divisive and they keep attacking each other. That's just a goldmine for Joe Donnelly. So basically free opposition research going into the fall for whoever emerges from the, the Republican side. But he just got on TV with his first statewide TV uh, ad. It's really like an introductory, like, here's Joe Donnelly. He's fighting for Hoosiers. He's driving his RV around. Um, I don't know that you'll see him specifically get into the attack ads. It'll probably be through outside groups on his behalf more than that. Um, but he's pretty happy to stay back. Just remind people that he is the current s senator for Indiana and, and let the fight play out on the other side. All right, we have to leave it at that. Brandon, thank you very much for all your reporting and looking forward to your coverage on election night. Thank you, Joe. Senator Todd Young was in Indianapolis this week for an event about Marine Corps recruitment. He wants to distance himself from the nastiness of the primary, but says it's important for the GOP winner to unify the party so Donnelly doesn't win another term. No, I'm looking forward to seeing uh, who ends up uh, winning the primary and, um, you know, I will be uh, supporting that person, which won't be uh, a surprise uh, to any fellow Republicans. Young is serving his first term in the Senate and he'll be up for re-election in 2022. Republican Trey Hollingsworth won Indiana's 9th District in 2016 amid a conservative swell led by President Donald Trump. Now, as Tyler Lake reports, Hollingsworth is fighting to keep his seat in Congress, but he's up against opponents on the left and the right. They call him an opportunist and an, and an outsider, pointing to his self-finance campaign and his Tennessee roots. With less than two years in Congress, Trey Hollingsworth hasn't had much time in Washington to demonstrate how his policies have improved the 9th District, which stretches from Greenwood to New Albany. But he says 9th District voters have benefited from his work to grow the economy. We've seen some tremendous strides, real and meaningful wage growth, real and meaningful job creation, real and meaningful expansion by small businesses. And I think that's so important all the way across the district. But many Indiana voters have come out in force to say that Hollingsworth doesn't have their best interest in mind. James Dean Allspach hopes he can win those Hoosier voters. He's challenging Hollingsworth in the primary. 
uh, everyone deserves to have their uh, candidacy challenged and have their ideas put through the crucible of public opinion. Uh, and, you know, uh, I'd have to give him uh, a mixed grade. Uh, no, he hasn't done a good job. While full of fiery rhetoric, Allspotch's fundraising numbers are nearly non-existent and stand in stark contrast to the hundreds of thousands of dollars in the Hollingsworth campaign coffers. Three Democrats are vying for the nomination to stand against Hollingsworth in the general election. Liz Watson, Dan Cannon, and Robert Chatlos. Political analyst Andrew Downs says all races are winnable, but for a Democrat to win the 9th district, they'll need something extra. Uh, you need things like the Me Too movement or the women's movement or pick any other movement that seems to be aligned with democratic uh, principles or the principles of the Democratic Party. Those are probably all going to have to line up just right. But that hasn't cowed the Democratic candidates, who have had multiple debates and public forums to engage with folks in the 9th District. Robert Chatlos is a truck driver and political outsider who hopes his blue-collar roots might be exactly what 9th District voters are looking for. I represent everybody, everybody in this district, from the homeless person to the wealthiest person that's in the borders of this, of this district. He says his straightforward style might offend some voters, but says his candor is what is needed in this political environment. Like Allspotch, Chatlos hasn't been able to accumulate a lot of money for his campaign. But he's confident in his grassroots approach and says his efforts are about getting voters support, not necessarily their donations. The two frontrunners in the Democratic primary have each raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. Both have spent years in public service but have drastically different backgrounds. Liz Watson has spent the past several years in Washington advocating for women and the working poor. She wrote public policy in her time as the labor policy director for the Democrats in Congress. I did things like work with the staff for Senator Elizabeth Warren. I worked with some of our real progressive champions on some of the issues that people said, you know, these, this is just the way it is today. People get treated like dirt at work. And I said, no, no, it doesn't have to be that way. We can change that. Dan Cannon has been a civil rights attorney. He has worked in Indiana and Kentucky representing teachers, labor unions, and veterans. He also worked on a landmark case that guaranteed same-sex couples the right to marry. He says his unusual background and willingness to fight for those in need make him the best candidate. Dropped out of high school when I was 17 and, um, you know, have been self-employed here, have been, uh, you know, I've had to, to live hand to mouth and I've had to um, go without health insurance. I've had to take on student loan debt and all that kind of stuff that, that normal people do in the 9th District. During town halls and debates over the last year, a big face was missing, Hollingsworth. Some Hoosiers point to this as proof the Tennessee native is not in touch with those he represents. Hey, Trey, talk to me! Hey, Trey, talk to me! With the election less than a week away, the candidates are sprinting across the district, making phone calls and reaching out to voters. Hollingsworth's on track to handily win the Republican primary. If he does, his job in the general election may be to connect with 9th District voters and convince them that he is listening to their voices. And whoever wins the Democratic battle will likely go up against the name recognition and deep pockets of the Hollingsworth campaign. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. We have a lot more coming up on Indiana News Desk. We'll look at whether recent gun control protests could drive young voters to the polls. And we'll step away from the election for a bit to catch up on other news making headlines. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, do you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, dear, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! 
idea. I knew it's just a blanket. Laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Young voters could be the deciding factor in close political races across the country this year. But as Barbara Brozier reports, the issue is you can't count on young voters to show up to the polls, especially for primary. There are more than 40,000 students on Indiana University's Bloomington campus. That's almost as many students as there are long-term residents of the city. They have the potential to significantly impact the outcome of elections. In fact, the Center for Information and Research on Civic Learning and Engagement at Tufts University named Indiana's U.S. Senate race among the top 10 races that could be influenced by young voters this year. It's a unique state in that small changes um, in the youth vote could really have an impact on both candidates and who, who they attract um, because, you know, there it is such a close race and because other age groups are so predominantly Republican. But that requires young voters to actually show up to the polls and historically they don't. Ever since people 18 to 21 got the vote in the early 1970s, the proportion of people under the age of 25 and in fact under the age of 30 coming out to vote has been um, somewhere between about half and, and maybe 60 percent of the turnout rate of elderly people, people 65 and over. In the 2016 presidential election, IU Bloomington's student voter turnout rate was just over 45 percent. And it's much lower for primaries. Students we talk to say they don't even know who the candidates are in next week's races. I feel like the only ones that I really affect me are like president, you know. I don't really know any of the candidates for the primary ones and like there's not, no one really knows about them I feel like, especially young people. I want to make educated uh, votes. I don't really just want to show up and just like, you know, check boxes and so I want to take time to actively um, you know, do some research, which is difficult in, in the busyness of what is classes right now. The university is trying to increase student participation in elections by helping them register to vote. IU is part of the Big Ten Voting Challenge, which is a friendly competition that started last year to increase student voter turnout. Basically, when they were following, tracking the data from 2012 to 2016, we had almost a 5% increase, which we were very excited about. One of the things research revealed is that there are several barriers to student voting, including transportation. That led a number of student groups to advocate for a more central voting location on campus this year. We actually think it's going to make a big difference. <laughs> Busing students from South Vigo County High School and West Vigo County High School is a good idea. Transportation to the polls is a barrier in Indiana School Corporation discussed too. The Vigo County School Board considered busing 18-year-old high school students to polling places. Community reaction was mixed, and ultimately, the board decided not to act on the proposal. We don't believe that taking kids out of school during the school day and busing them to the polls is uh, the right thing to do at this time or in the future. However, we do think it's important to get them to the polls. Recent student-led protests surrounding gun control helped spark the discussion about transportation in Vigo County. The level of student activism in response to the Parkland, Florida shooting is something the country hasn't seen since the Vietnam War. But that momentum is unlikely to translate to a significant impact at the polls. The turnout rates in the past, when there have been other movements that have been very important to a lot of young people, have suggested that that generates maybe a slight blip, but not a big one. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. Primary turnout among young voters is expected to be especially low in Monroe County because IU is wrapping up classes this week. And now we talk to Bernard Fraga, who teaches political science at Indiana University. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. Uh, we wanted to get, uh, we heard about a lot of the big races. I wanted to get a little bit to the fourth and sixth uh, Indiana district races, just because you have two incumbents who are running for, Rakita and Messer, who are running for U.S. Senate. So let's start with that fourth district. Anything pop out at you there? Sure. So, I mean, the fourth district is a heavily Republican district. It voted about 17 percentage points more 
for Republican presidential candidates than the nation as a whole. So even with Trump's victory, it was still far more Republican than the average district. Now, when you look at that district, that means that the Republican primary is going to be very key. The winner of the Republican primary is very likely to win the general. And we have three candidates there that look like they might have a chance of winning. They've raised a substantial amount of money, and it's going to be very close. Steve Braun, who's uh, Mike Braun's brother, obviously, is going to be running. Jim Baird and Diego Morales. The three of them have a reasonable chance of winning. So let's talk about the 6th district. We talk about brothers. Uh, we, we have a big name there, too, sure. with uh, Vice, President, Vice President Mike Pence. His brother, Greg Pence, is running. Is that kind of the storyline there in the 6th district? I think so. I mean, in a normal election, right, he'd be seen as clear in a way the front runner, and he is leading in the polls as far as we can tell, but Jonathan Lamb has staged a campaign running against him. There's been a slight bit of disagreement on the issue of tariffs, maybe an opportunity to see Lamb separating himself from the Trump administration and from Pence's brother, the vice president, a little bit, but we'll see. Uh, you know, you, we talked earlier about this, but um, do you get a sense that student activism, we, we've been seeing a lot in the news about students getting involved, women, you know, the Me Too movement and stuff like that. Is that going to have a big impact in people headed to the polls? You know, as we just heard, it's really tough to have young people mobilized in elections, especially in primary elections. Now, these are close elections, so anything matters, and a little bit of a change in voter turnout could have a large impact or disproportionate impact. But as far as we've seen, there's more people running for office, there's a lot of interest and engagement, but it's not clear that it's going to manifest in big changes in who wins and who loses elections. All right, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. A state agency is reminding Hoosiers with disabilities that they have options when it comes to voting. Indiana Disability Rights offers a voting hotline for those who face challenges at their polling places. Hoosiers with disabilities have a lower rate of success when voting than those who don't have a disability. And that could be because, of course, they face several challenges when voting. Many times poll workers who are volunteers have not been trained on how to use the equipment. So once they or get to the vote, polling location to vote, they don't know how to use the equipment. And then there are also other issues where perhaps the equipment hasn't been plugged in. Perhaps it hasn't even been turned on that day to make sure it works. Trimble says people can call the Indiana Disability Rights Hotline to get help in those situations. She says while the organization encourages in-person voting, other options are available for those with disabilities. Now we're going to take a look at some other news this week. We go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Prosecutors in Lake Marion and Monroe County say they won't defend the state in a suit challenging a new anti-abortion law. The law requires all doctors, hospitals, and clinics to report abortion complications to the state. Planned Parenthood is suing over the law. In a statement, the prosecutors say the law appears unconstitutional and they don't want to devote resources to defending it. Police aren't releasing the names, but say they've identified more than one juvenile who they say is responsible for painting racial slurs near the DePaul campus. There have been several racially motivated incidents over the past few months. DePaul students responded with protests and have been urging university administrators to do more to ensure their safety. A Columbus church that's a national historic landmark is on the state's list of most endangered places. As Sophia Salaby reports, the church isn't in disrepair now, but preservationists worry about the future. The spire on North Christian Church in Columbus pierces the sky at almost 200 feet. The building is six-sided. Architect Aero Saarinen designed the iconic building in the early 1960s, and Dan Kiley landscaped the almost 14 acres of land the church sits on. But this historic piece of architecture could be in trouble. Indiana Landmarks named the church on its annual 10 Most Endangered list this week. There's nothing wrong with the church now, but the size of the congregation is declining. The sanctuary can fit more than 400 people, but membership has dwindled to about 50 congregants. And there are big purchases on the horizon. For example, the church needs a whole new HVAC system. So over the last couple of years, um, it has become apparent that we're, we need some help. We need a partner or partners to help us raise the funds to be able to do that in order to upkeep this building. Girardi says the congregation has also looked into other possible cost-saving solutions to keep the building protected. 
like sharing the space with another faith community or a performing arts group. Our hope is that we'll be here forever, of course, but our hope also is that it will always be maintained as a sacred space. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sophia Salaby. The Muncie Fieldhouse and St. Joseph's College are among the other 10 properties on the list. Indiana's Mr. Basketball is staying home in Indiana. Romeo Langford is heading to IU next year. He finished his high school career in New Albany, ranked number four all time among Indiana boys with scoring more than 3,000 points. And that was such big news this week, Joe, that one of the Indiana Senate candidates actually had to interrupt the debate and announce <laughs> he's coming to IU. Well, it's great to see Indiana basketball players stay. Good ones right here in the state too and not go elsewhere like Michigan. Absolutely. Right? It's going to be a fun season to it watch. It should be. Thanks, Barbara. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. And be sure to check back on election night for live results here and on our sister station, WFIU, and online. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. The Radio and TV News Endowment, a fund established by listeners and viewers to sustain reporting of Indiana news. More information at indianapublicmedia.org slash support. And by WTIU members. Thank you.